Hey guys, this is Eric from Invensys, and I welcome you to our YouTube channel. In today's session, we will discuss the top 10 examples of project failure. Before we start, let us quickly go through the agenda. As you can see, we will discuss 10 different case studies. Here, we will talk about the project, what went wrong, and finally, how the problems could have been prevented. I hope the agenda of today's session is very clear. If you like this video, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also, to learn more about project management and its practices, check out Invensys Learning's Project Management Certification Training on PRINCE2, Project Management Fundamentals, PO, CAPMAN and MSP. All of the necessary information is given in the description box below. Let's get started with the first example of project failure without any further ado. In the first case study, we will be talking about the failure of the Dyson Electric Car Project. The future of transportation is here, and it's electric, of course. As a result, over the past 10 years, the development of electric automobiles has been a growth sector, and the rate of change continues to accelerate. Dyson Limited is one of the most recent contenders to throw up the towel. He is an engineer, a technologist, and an entrepreneur who invented high-end household appliances, mostly vacuum cleaners. Dyson, who is always on the lookout for new domains in which he can apply his technical skills, embarked on the challenging task of designing an electric automobile from the ground up. The leap from vacuum cleaners to automobiles is, of course, enormous, and investing in the project required a quantum leap of faith. The project began in 2017 when the British entrepreneur revealed that he would invest £2 billion in developing a battery electric car that would be available in 2020. Dyson received a £16 million grant from the UK government in 2016 to help develop batteries for its electric fleet. Now let us discuss what went wrong in this project. Despite declaring in October 2018 that they will build the cars at a new facility in Singapore, the business had intended to invest a further £200 million on its UK-based research and development and test track capabilities. A significant portion of this cash has already been spent, and Dyson has said that the locations will now be utilised for other purposes. According to the founder, the remaining £2.5 billion investment will be used to continue developing new technologies, including electric batteries, robots, and artificial intelligence, and expanding the Dyson Institute of Engineering and Technology. More than 500 people worked in the electric vehicle division. Dyson stated that he and his colleagues are attempting to immediately identify new positions for as many staff as feasible within the company. To be fair, Dyson's bold move paid off, with reports indicating that his fledgling prototype progressed to a fully working car that was close to being ready for manufacturing. However, once expenditures surpassed £500 million, the massive product introduction costs became apparent. As a result, the project was cancelled because it was realized that in order to recoup the investment and production expenses, the completed product would have to be priced higher than the market would bear. Hopefully, some of the technology will find a way ahead, and some of that work will be rewarded, but as it is, the project may not be disastrous for Dyson. Still, it is almost certainly a huge disappointment for those who invested in its success. Now there are a few lessons to be learned from this project failure. For starters, there isn't enough upfront due diligence. Costs, competitive market landscape, market size, production costs, and profit margins were not properly analyzed. Costs are underestimated. Perfectionism and inflexibility are other reasons why the project failed. Unbalanced focal points also can cause the team to focus only on the product rather than the full spectrum of work needed to launch a car brand. In the second case study, we will talk about the failure of the launch of the new Coke. For a long time, Coke was the most popular soft drink. Coke's main product share was on the fall in the 1980s, while its competitor Pepsi's increased. Despite large advertising budgets, many vending machines, a global presence, a larger network of vendors, and competitive pricing, Coke's market share was progressively decreasing. Pepsi announced an ad called Pepsi Challenge. They performed blind testing of cola drinks, which further sunk Coke's shares. In this blind test, consumers preferred Pepsi in the blind test. Using the blind test findings, Pepsi could go on with newfound enthusiasm. Coke conducted its blind testing. It was shocking people favored Pepsi over the legendary Coke a century-old cola's secret recipe in blind testing. Coke believed that the audience had altered the way they quenched their thirst and that it was time to update the long-held personal taste formula. Scientists changed the formula to make it sweeter, similar to Pepsi. They created a new Coca-Cola that was smoother than previous versions. Coke's market analysts saw huge improvements in blind testing of new Coke done with thousands of customers. 
It looked that the new Coke would be a hit and increase its market share. So, what went wrong? The company's outcomes were devastating. So many concerned consumers went out and bought so much Coke that they loaded their basements and vacant rooms as soon as the flavor change news was revealed. The company had not anticipated pushback after so many blind testing and focus groups. At all the Cola's events, there were massive demonstrations and fury. The Coca-Cola company was ultimately obliged to put back classic Coke, a Coke with the original recipe. So, what lessons could we take from this failure? Firstly, sometimes it is best to ignore your competitors. Benchmarking your competitors' products, behavior, and strategy is a waste of time and energy, it is not a reliable source of market information. Instead, we need to look at users slash consumers to receive accurate market signals. You won't be doing what your competition isn't doing if you try to combine everything he does. Coke fell victim to Pepsi's marketing strategy and began developing a sweeter product than Pepsi, losing its originality in the process. Next is the myth of a consumer's rational mind. In focus group tests, everyone agreed that the new Coke tasted nice, sweeter, and smoother. As a result, many people have shown an interest in purchasing the new Coke. So, why did new Coke fail in real-world scenarios? The Coke market researchers did not consider intuitive, non-descriptive, associative memories slash emotions that are deeply rooted in our minds and linked to the brand Coke. The rational thinking of the buyer may not understand why they appreciate a certain product. The logical mind is more active than the subconscious mind in focus groups owing to the new surroundings, thoughts of being monitored by someone in the back of mind, the presence of other unknown users, and the possibility of being humiliated. Consumers in those focus groups tend to rationalize their thoughts and invent their logical rationale to defend their actions. The subconscious mind was responsible for the majority of their emotions. As a result, the focus group results would not be a good indicator of a new product success. It is also important to incorporate the right research method. To foresee a product's success or failure, the research method must grasp the inner subconscious rather than the logical mind. Coca-Cola should have put the new product to the test in a real-world setting and looked for real-world results. Consumers did not anticipate Coke to be sweeter because it was a refreshing beverage. Consumers preferred a drink that made them feel good rather than one that was too sugary. The final lesson learned is the problems associated with the sip test. The tasters in blind testing did not drink the entire can. To test, they'd just take a sip. Did any genuine customer taste and then return the container? No. Pepsi is a sweeter product than Coca-Cola, which is meant to refresh people and hence is less sweet, so Pepsi had an immediate advantage in sip testing since consumers would perceive it to taste pleasant. However, consuming an entire sweetness can be overwhelming, and some people become disoriented. In the next case study, we will talk about the failure of the Levi Type 1 genes. Levi Strauss released their Type 1 genes in the early 2000s, which included exaggerated details such as buttons, stitching, and rivets. Unfortunately, the firm launched a Super Bowl ad that only served to confuse shoppers, and the style never took off, prompting Levi's to abandon the initiative. So let's now understand what went wrong in the launch of these jeans. Firstly the customers were confused about the style of the jeans. While we don't know about Levi's project management practices, one strategy to minimize misunderstanding is strengthening internal communications so that the final product has a clear message that ends consumers can understand. Now, let us discuss some solutions to how one could avoid these problems. Firstly, intensify rather than multiply. Instead of emphasizing its key brand principles, Levi's has perplexed jeans purchasers with an ostensibly endless variety of designs. In the long run, increasing your brand will erode your strength and undermine your image, says brand guru Al Rees. Second, focus on your assets. If there's one thing Levi's stands for, it's that original gene. It will need to solidify and enhance its identity to recover properly. Finally, don't diminish the importance of your original brand. Unfortunately, Levi's fell into the same trap as Coca-Cola when they debuted new Coke. The next case study is on the NHS Civilian IT Project. The National Program for IT of the National Health Service, NHS, was the largest public sector IT program ever tried in the UK, with an initial budget of £6 billion over the key contract's lifetime. The NPFIT's main goal was to modernize the NHS's use of information technology by introducing integrated electronic patient record systems, online select and book services, computerized referral, and prescription systems, and supporting network infrastructure. Despite the fact that many of these services were never delivered, the government, and eventually taxpayers, 
faced considerable expenses due to the initiative, including contract transition and departure costs totaling more than £10 billion. Now let us talk about what went wrong in this project. Politicians and program administrators rushed rapidly into policymaking, procurement, and implementation procedures in their hurry to enjoy the benefits of the program, leaving little time for engagement with important stakeholders and failing to address confidentiality issues. This led to an unreasonable schedule, short preliminary work, failure to assess progress against expectations, and failure to test systems. The next problem was the failed design. The government sought an overly ambitious and unmanageable centralized strategy to cut expenses and promote rapid acceptance at the local level without considering user happiness and confidentiality problems. This failed to recognize the risks or limitations of large IT projects, a failure to recognize that the longer a project takes, the more likely it is to be overtaken by new technology. Sheer ambition, a project too big for the leadership to handle effectively, challenges with confidentiality, and culture and skills. Furthermore, the NPFIT lacked clear direction, project management, and an exit plan, which meant that the NPFIT inevitable setbacks swiftly developed into system-wide disasters. Furthermore, the Department of Health's and government's cultures were not favorable to quickly identifying and correcting strategic or technical faults. This resulted in a lack of clear leadership, not knowing or constantly changing the project's goal, not committing the necessary budget from the start, not providing training, a lack of concern for privacy issues, no exit plans and no alternatives, a lack of project management skills, a treasury emphasis on price over quality, IT suppliers who rely on lowballing for contracts and charge heavily for variations to poorly written specifications, and a lack of project management skills. Now let us talk about how the NHS could have done things differently. Several lessons for project managers, IT experts, and business executives may be found in this case study. It is important to understand the problem. Projects top-down are considerably more likely to fail than projects that are bottom-up, and NPFIT was the epitome of a top-down effort. The drive for launching NPFIT came from the cabinet, and it's difficult to deny that many of its objectives were admirable. Any initiative, much alone one that would revolutionize a key building block of a nation's healthcare system, must be initiated by the proper people who are well-versed in the challenges. It's tragic for civil servants and the departments they lead to bear the brunt of ministerial proposals that frequently only make sense on paper and are nearly difficult to implement. This is why understanding your problem is half the solution for more insights on this topic. The next important lesson is to engage stakeholders. A project should rarely be considered an IT project, rather, it should be viewed as part of a larger process to bring business advantages. The importance of excellent consultation with all stakeholders involved, including end-users, is a given in successful technological initiatives. However, since the start of NPFIT, major players in the health system, particularly doctors and GPs, have raised concerns about the intended system's accessibility and usability. Even from the start of the NPFIT project, it was unclear exactly what would be supplied to the eventual end-users. Add in NHS trusts ingrained concerns about losing control of their systems, and you have a user base that is naturally distrustful, if not outright hostile. Finally, learn how to start slow in order to run fast later. One of the lessons to be learned is that projects will always run into difficulties if they attempt to finish contractual documentation before determining the scope of the project, its deliverables, and how they will be implemented. The final lesson is to balance risk and reward. One lesson that the government should take from NPFIT is that there must be a balance of risk and reward when negotiating contracts, particularly for extremely big projects. Since the inception of NPFIT, the typical paradigm for public sector contract terms has shifted dramatically. As a result, many people may wish that more rational voices had been engaged in the initial initiative, who might have fought for a more moderate, deliverable contract that didn't require service providers to take on so many contractual risks that their internal business cases became unsustainable. Moving on to the next case study, we have the McDonald's Arch Deluxe Burger. McDonald's, the world's largest restaurant chain by sales, has expanded its operations to service over 100 countries worldwide, attempting to cater to varied markets by offering a diverse menu of food options based on local consumer preferences. Despite McDonald's having already stabilized its market with popular goods such as the iconic Big Mac and the new all-day breakfast, many products with unique concepts failed catastrophically. Arch Deluxe Burger is one of their discontinued offerings. McDonald's chose to design a new burger style specifically for adult consumers to diversify their demographic market from children-centered and family-friendly to a broader one that includes a more mature audience. 
However, after spending $150 million on advertising, such a burger failed to win over the public's hearts and was terminated in 2000. So, what went wrong? McDonald's assumed that urban sophisticated adults would be interested in this burger. The Arch Deluxe was created to promote McDonald's exquisite food to the metropolitan adult market. On the other hand, adults were unwilling to spend extra for marginally modified burgers. Because McDonald's is a fast food restaurant, its primary target audience is people who choose inexpensive convenience over complexity and exquisite taste. In any event, folks who want to consume refined cuisine and are unconcerned about the cost would prefer to dine at a formal dining establishment rather than a fast food establishment. Next, they assumed they only needed to address a new target audience for their new product. Another reason for the campaign's failure was that it went against McDonald's original brand of child-friendly and family-friendly. Designing a new burger that excludes minors and focuses on luxury consumer groups resulted in a loss of trust and a break in the relationship with previous consumers. So let us take a look at how these mistakes could have been avoided. Lesson 1, don't make consumers confused. When people think of a brand, they will know why it is famous. Thus the image of the brand should be clear and uncomplicated. Adding items that are inconsistent with the brand's identity may cause buyers to get confused. Lesson 2, the most important factors are time and market trends. Although an expensive burger with excessively good beef and other components in a fast food chain looked impossible in the 1990s, it is now a common trend that has shown to be successful in many fast food businesses. Burgers from fast food restaurants are no longer simply for children. Adults are frequently seen eating burgers with complex components that cost less than $10 these days. Ford Edsel is one of the most spectacular project failure examples in automotive history. Before releasing the Edsel, Ford's team conducted intensive market research, including studies to ensure that the automobile had the correct personality to attract the ideal consumer. They spent 10 years and $250 million on research and development, but by the time the automobile was presented in 1957, Ford had missed its opportunity. The market had already moved on to tiny automobiles, and the Edsel was no longer available. What are some of the lessons learned? The Ford Edsel is a fantastic example of a failed project highlighting the significance of speed to market and how even a significant brand and product may fail if a project loses velocity. In addition, poor communication and missed deadlines may derail a project to the point that it is no longer relevant or valuable, much less effective. Paying close attention to aspects like resource availability and utilization, ensuring project personnel are working to their full capacity and to the best of their abilities, allows for more accurate project timetable projections and prevents projects from dragging. In the next case study, we will talk about the Airbus A380. The Airbus A380, at the time the world's biggest commercial aircraft, required production facilities from all over the world to construct separate plane elements. Regrettably, these groups employed distinct computer-aided design, CAD, software. As a result, they noticed the elements created by separate teams didn't fit together during installation. As a result, the corporation had to spend $6 billion to fix the problem, which delayed the project by two years. Let us now discuss some of the lessons learned. The Airbus A380 is an example of a failed project that demonstrates the value of effective worker collaboration. Unexpected difficulties will always be a difficulty, but when your team is situated remotely or in silos, the challenges are multiplied. Reporting difficulties and coordinating the appropriate response, for example, might take longer. The problem might have been rectified during the installation phase before it was too late if Airbus's scattered project teams had valued communication more highly. When teams collaborate across time zones, it's critical to establish objectives and KPIs to ensure everyone understands their responsibilities, including what they're expected to do and when. Resource management enables you to alter resource data in real time, allowing you to handle any issues that arise quickly. It's tough to gather everyone in a room, discuss the problem, and develop a solution when you're using remote employees. Real-time data and comprehensive visibility over your resources are provided by resource management systems, allowing you to make changes quickly. The next project that we will talk about is IBM Stretch Project. A group of IBM computer experts started in 1956 to create the world's fastest supercomputer. The IBM 7030, also known as Stretch, was the company's first transistorized supercomputer, and the first machine was delivered to the Los Alamos National Laboratory in 1961. Stretch was the world's fastest computer, capable of processing half a million instructions per second, and remained so until 1964. Despite this, the 7030 was deemed a failure. The Stretch was only 30 to 40 times faster than the system it was supposed to replace, 
Despite IBM's first pitch to Los Alamos to construct a computer 100 times faster than the system it was supposed to replace, IBM had to reduce Stretch's pricing from $13.5 million to $7.8 million after failing to fulfill its objective, implying that the system was priced below cost. Only nine of the 7,030s were ever produced after the business ceased selling them. However, the pipelining, memory protection, memory interleaving, and other innovations established by Stretch affected the evolution of computers as we know them today. So, it is okay even if you don't meet your project's main goals, you may retrieve some of its values. In the next case study, we will talk about Sony's Betamax. Sony's Betamax video recorders are the all-time classic among technology brand flops. In the 1970s, Sony created a machine that delivered home videotaping equipment. The machine was released in 1975 and featured Betamax technology. 30,000 Betamax video recorders, or VCRs, were sold in the United States alone in the first year. However, Sony's competitor JVC released the VHS, short for Video Home System Dash Format VCR a year later. Four other Japanese electronics companies were producing and marketing VHS-based equipment by January 1977. Unlike Sony, which was either reluctant or unable to license Betamax technology, JVC was glad to share their VHS format. Unfortunately, this would subsequently be a crucial reason for the project's failure. There were also additional marketing issues. Until the early 1980s, the term Betamax was used interchangeably with video recorder. This relationship had both beneficial and negative effects when, in 1979, Universal Studios and Disney filed a lawsuit against Sony, alleging that VCRs infringed on movie makers' copyrights. Even though Sony appears to have come out of the lawsuit uninjured, numerous critics have stated that the case negatively influenced how Sony promoted its Betamax products. Because Sony was the only company that made Betamax video recorders, it couldn't compete with the rising number of firms promoting VHS. But, on the other hand, Sony did not forsake Betamax when it began producing VHS equipment. So what lessons can we learn from this case study? Firstly, it's not a good idea to undertake it all alone. As long as the competitor isn't promoting a format that clashes with yours. Secondly, allow others to enter. Whether or not Sony declined to license its format, it is undeniable that the firm would have had a better chance if its competitors had embraced Betamax. Next, minimize your losses. Sony's choice to ignore VHS until 1987 was an unmitigated blunder with hindsight. Also, demand equal supply. For example, demand for Sony's Betamax recorders dwindled as makers of pre-recorded tapes reduced their supply of beta format tapes. In the last case study, we will talk about the release of the Polaroid Instant Home. Polaroid was once the polar opposite of a company failure case study since it had been an industry leader for decades, but there came a moment when it wasn't. Its collapse was due to a lack of innovation. This was due to a misunderstanding about dealing with failure in the workplace. In the field of photography, Polaroid was the market leader. It was so enormous that Polaroid became synonymous with instant photography, yet the firm was always more concerned with honing its technology than with invention, even from the start. Among other things, its lack of vision would be a major cause of its demise. The demise of Polaroid was driven by a mix of inappropriate behavior at the top, disputes, and an inability to adapt to changing circumstances. Polaroid was a victim of patent violations and poor corporate policy, and it simply could not adjust quickly enough. Around the year 2000, the business concepts that had made them profitable began to collapse since its foundation in 1937. Let us discuss some of the main reasons Polaroid couldn't keep up with the times, and ultimately failed. But, first, why did they got destroyed in the age of digital cameras? And finally, you'll find the lessons to take from the company's history so you can avoid the same mistakes with your business. There was a failure to capitalize on its research. Since the 1960s, Polaroid's RAND department has been working on digital photography. Polaroid owned 15% of the camera market in the United States by the 1970s, and the corporation only continued to grow from there. It created dozens of patents for quick imaging solutions and filed for them. Despite this, digital imaging accounted for over 42% of total RAND investment in 1989. In the late 1990s, Polaroid was the most popular digital camera brand. Surprisingly, the firm did not take advantage of its study. Because that decision was made at the highest level of management, the executives of Polaroid were the ones who endorsed such antiquated technology. But, more crucially, they did not do adequate market research. The next mistake was the over-reliance on one aspect of the business. Polaroid had a whopping 65% gross margin on instant film at one time. 
so it was undeniably the most important gear in their financial machine. But, unfortunately, it determined the company's finances, and as a result, Polaroid officials opted not to expand. Even the company's founder, Edwin Land, refused to put additional money into electronics. The only thing on their minds was instant film. This resulted in substantial financial mismanagement, including significant investments in digital photographic research and development that the firm failed to profit on. So what are the lessons to be learned from this failure? The failure of Polaroid was caused by two factors, a faulty business plan and a fear of becoming innovators in their profession. Polaroid may have controlled today's industry given their early research into digital photography. However, the dread of failure set in early in the organization. If you want to stay successful, you can't be too afraid of business failure. Having the ability to branch out, innovate, and understand the market is vital. With this, we come to the end of today's session on top 10 examples of project failure. If this has spiked your interest and you want to know more about project management, I recommend you to opt for PMP certification training and clear the exam. At Invensys Learning, we provide various PMP certifications that will pave the way for your career in project management. We are accredited by respective governing bodies or courses in line with their guidelines for each of these certifications. Post-enrollment, you will get lifetime access to a personalized learning management system. LMS has all the class recordings, live class, webinar links along with assignments and case studies to practice. All classes are live instructor-led delivered by trainers with rich domain experience. Thank you guys. See you in the next session.